All right, guys, welcome to the chat. Hello, so glad to uh, see you. I was communicating with some of you uh, prior to signing on tonight. Let me just welcome Mel Kep. I saw you just sign in. Welcome, glad to have you tonight. I also see Courtney Frazier. Let me just take a brief um, peek at what you're seeing. Hmm. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, Courtney, I'm so sorry to hear that. I mean, I can, I can humbly say that, um, my, my health isn't well either. Still dealing with concussions and fatigue and the list just goes on. Um, so my heart goes out to you. I hope everything goes well for you on Monday. My, my, my best advice, and this has worked for me being a patient recently is really just taking some time to rest, reflect and build yourself up spiritually and emotionally. So you can kind of charge through and, and get through all these medical things that's going on. So that's my best advice to you. Hang in there, Courtney. I, I know just exactly what you're going through. Um, I see you, Sammy. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Sammy says, I live on the other side of the planet, so my next holiday is Christmas. No Thanksgiving here. Wow, I had no idea. That's awesome. Um, you're not missing much if there's no Thanksgiving where you are. You're not missing much at all. So, But welcome to the chat. Phoenix, hello, welcome, glad to have you tonight. She, she, fit, 444, hello, welcome, glad to see you. Um, B, hello, welcome to the chat, glad to have you tonight. Um, Randolph Howard, wow, from New Orleans, welcome to the chat, so glad to see you. And Fairy Girl, thank you so much for that, much peace back to you, I haven't seen you in so, so long in a live chat, it feels like. Welcome, glad to have you tonight. Um, I'm sure a lot of a lot more of you will sign on as we go along, but my goal is to wrap up at seven here. Um, I don't know if you can tell, I'm a little exhausted tonight, um, and you guys probably um, are tired too. I don't know about you, but after holidays, I'm like nothing else. Please, please. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna get through this live chat tonight. Let me give you a little bit of background on why this is a topic. So. Um, my, I'll start with me. My channel was, was developed and based on family trauma. That's basically the foundation of this channel. Recently, I've kind of branched out and I've given you guys some pretty broad topics um, just to get, our, get ourselves thinking and processing and, and just kind of picking and pulling things apart. So that's kind of the foundation of this channel is family trauma. So tonight we're doing a little bit of something interesting here. I'm going to bring in the topic of evil, but I'm also going to bring in dark family behaviors. And when I say dark family behaviors, I'm talking about those family members who are unhealthy. They are, they are toxic for lack of a clinical term. They are dysfunctional, dysregulated, and they seem to love and enjoy disequilibrium. You know, meaning they don't like things to be balanced. You know, they, they kind of function in chaos. So I'm going to bring that in to this topic of, of evil relationships. I, I want you to also see this topic in this way, that that dark family behavior can also, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, can also encompass dark empathy. And there's some of you that's probably like, oh, my God, I hate that term um, be, because it just seems so opposite right dark and then empathy that doesn't go together but i'm going to break down for you guys why i'm titling this live chat dark family behaviors um and 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 i think mainly that's because there's some dark empathy uh that i'm going to be highlighting and then i'm also going to give you guys 15 tips on how to manage dark family behaviors and how to deal with these family members um i think and i personally think um, as well as clinically, that a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their their minds around family being anything other than family. Um, and and so because of that, I think we become more of a victim than than we want to, right? We're kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of at the front line here in our family and we're getting hit because we trust them, we love them, we care about them, we want to believe that they are exactly what should be in our lives and unfortunately that's not always the case so i'm going to pull in a lot of stuff tonight so bear with me um i see some more of you signing on let me just welcome you guys and then we're going to jump into uh what may be occurring in your family if you feel that you have some kind of dark family behaviors 
um, <clears throat> or if you feel like you have some, excuse me, if you feel like you have some dark um, empath traits within your family, okay? So I'm going to give you guys some insights in just a little bit. Let me welcome Anibis, the opener of Ways. Hello, welcome to the chat. Says, uh, hello, Tamara, and hello to the chat. I love your hair. Thank you so much. This is my after holiday, I really don't care hairstyle. But thank you for that, Anibis, the opener of ways. Um, thank you, Retro Woman uh, 80, almost said 90. Oh, my God. 80 says, sorry about the concussion issue, Tamara. It won't let you have peace. No, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. I, I was at my vestibular um, therapy, I think, last week, and I was literally on the verge of tears. I'm like, I just want to get better. That's all I want. So it's, 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 it's a lot, but... Um, Maybe, maybe somewhere I'll make some progress. I'm praying and hoping that I do. And you guys are so sweet about it, so thank you. Susan, oh, I'm going to mess this up. Walhow, hopefully I got that correctly, from Minnesota. Welcome, glad to have you, and I don't remember seeing you, so welcome to the chat. Um, Elizabeth says, I will have a big operation on next Friday. Oh, you guys are talking health stuff. Um, but I don't think I could build myself up emotionally and spiritually until that. Yeah, I get that, Elizabeth. That operation needs so much preparation. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. My my suggestion for you, Liz, uh, Elizabeth, would be, you know, just try to stay as calm as you can. You don't want your fight or flight mode to be in full operation. And you've got to, you know, you've got to get a big procedure done. So, that would be my suggestion for you. Hang in there. Hang in there. Um, I hate ads. Oh, my God. That's the best title ever. That is the best screen name. I, I was watching a, a YouTube clip the other day, and I'm like, why do we have to deal with all these ads? And I don't know if you guys realize, maybe you have, that the ads now are like there's no skip. So I'm like hitting my phone. I'm like, you can't skip. You have to watch it. So that was a side note. But I hate ads. Hello. Welcome to the chat. Lara Sodom, Sodomlak. Hopefully I said that correctly. Thank you so much for the best wishes and welcome to the chat. Glad to have you. Oh my goodness. It's been cold lately. Hello. Welcome to the chat. So glad to have you as well. Yeah, Phoenix. This is great. Phoenix, I don't know if I welcomed you. Welcome to the chat says, I'm just going to read this briefly, guys, then we're going to jump in. Says, I'm exhausted, period, from life and overwhelmed and have to live with family right now. So I feel you. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of us are just exhausted in this world, period. But then you have family members that are unhealthy and they are toxic and it's like something's got to give, right? Lisa G, hello from California. Welcome to the chat. Okay, let's jump in, guys, because you guys are so awesome, and a lot of you sign on. I could do this all night, so I'm going to acknowledge you as we go along. L let me just start off by what you may see occurring in your family. So if you're dealing with dark family behavior that is evil, there's one thing that you might be faced with, and maybe or maybe not you, you recognize it, and it's called motivational conflict, motivational conflict. So kind of zone into this with me right now because I'm going to throw some, some concepts at you here just to kind of get you going. Motivational conflict, conflict is basically this, that something is going on at the core of your family, right? Let's see it's family secrets. There's intergenerational trauma, there's family trauma, there's relational aggression, all of that stuff, right? That's, that's what's occurring at the foundation of your family. Motivational conflict says this, the theory says this, that okay, there's a dark family secret that has been kind of pushed under the rug, right? And that dark family secret could be uh, sexual assault or child molestation, it could be physical, emotional, psychological abuse, it could be trauma bonds. It could be intergenerational trauma. Whatever the case, right? It's something that's been pushed under the carpet. And now you are faced with one of two things. One, I have either... I, because I exist in this toxic, unhealthy family system, I have either the option to see the, the evil and the problems at the surface and act like I don't see it, or I can tell somebody about it or talk about it or address it head on. So motivational conflict says I'm actually conflicted within my family system as to what I should do. And that kind of creates a problem for you psychologically, emotionally. And, and, and I think it can also be traumatizing depending on what that, that thing is that you're pushing under the carpet. So 
Research suggests that in families where there is dark empathy, you are likely to struggle with motivational conflict. You want to you you want to connect with other family members and tell them something that maybe is going on in your family, something that you're you're maybe facing that just doesn't make sense to you, or it's painful or it's hurtful. So you you want to connect with your family and say, hey, this is what's going on in this family, and this needs to stop. But then you're also kind of afraid to step out and talk about it or you're afraid to address it or you just want to close your eyes to it and don't look at it like the rest of your family has so that you can con so that you can continue oh my god to move forward without any issues right so you're conflicted your motivation tends to be i'm just going to push this under the carpet and act like i don't see it Okay, motivational conflict. The other thing within families where there's dark empathy or there's a dark empath, a narcissist, a psychopath, usually uh, there is something known as cyclic interactions, meaning that most of the toxic, dysfunctional, unhealthy behaviors within a family is cyclic. It happens on a cycle. It doesn't just happen once. It doesn't just happen twice and it's over. It's cyclic, right? And it's a constant cycle. It's like a loop. And you might even want to pull in the concept of the abuse cycle or the cycle of abuse. I'll post that in the description box for you after this live chat so that you can kind of, you know, sit and process if you don't know about it, the cycle of abuse. But, you know, interactions within toxic, dark families, evil relationships within a family tends to be cyclic, right? You also want to think about within families like this, uh, what's the what's the empathy deficit here, right? It, it, is is empathy existing at the foundation of my family, or is it not? And if there is empathy in some fashion within my family, is it inconsistent? Meaning that maybe a family member has shown some empathy, but not to you. So it's inconsistent. Or maybe they have shown some empathy when they were younger, but now that they're older, they no longer do, okay? So inconsistent empathy. The other one is non-existent. Maybe it just doesn't exist at all within my family. So this is something that you're probably likely to see if you believe there's dark empathy within your family, the empathy deficit, okay? Either it's inconsistent or it's non-existent. It's completely gone. Um, and lastly, maybe it's limited. You might want to ask yourself, maybe the empathy is there, but it's limited within my family. Or if it's not limited, maybe it's inconsistent. I I've heard of situations where, and I've had this uh, in my practice a couple weeks ago, where a client has come in and she's like, my dad used to just love me and adore me and give me just about anything. And now that he turns 62, he's mean, he's ornery, he's defensive, he has barriers up, he's judgmental, right? And, and so maybe there was some empathy, love, and connection at some point, and now there's this detachment within the family system. Or again, maybe this, this family member is just inconsistent when it comes to empathy. You also want to learn about, and, and maybe Google after this live chat, what's known as sub clinical symptoms. Now, within a family that um, tends to have uh, dark empathy at the core of how it functions, so narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. Let me just give you a definition briefly of Machiavellianism. And I talk about this so much, you guys are probably well aware, but I'm going to throw it out here really quickly. Machiavellianism is this deep-seated internal stimulation and pleasure that uh, narcissists and psychopaths get when they do something harmful or problematic to you, okay? Um, it's this, again, it's this, this kind of internal stimulation and excitement that the individual gets when they do something harmful to you. So subclinical symptoms can exist within a family where there's dark empathy, meaning they may not meet the diagnostic criteria to be diagnosed. They may not meet the diagnostic criteria to be labeled a dark empath, labeled a narcissist, labeled uh, antisocial personality disorder. Their symptoms are subclinical, meaning that they are walking a very thin line. I've had some family members come in to see me for therapy and it's so frustrating when I sit there and I ask all the necessary clinical questions I get all of the developmental history I get all of the relational stuff all the job related stuff and I'm sitting there looking at this assessment after the fact and I'm thinking I'm missing something it's not necessarily and I've learned this over time it's not necessarily that 
uh, therapists are missing something or I miss something, sometimes the symptoms within toxic, problematic families are subclinical. They are not meeting full diagnostic criteria for maybe something we think they should be, okay? And that usually happens with narcissism. Narcissistic personality disorder is a really difficult diagnosis because a person can be, have, they can kind of walk the line and they can have subclinical symptoms, meaning this, this is, you're right here when it comes to narcissism. Like I could give you the diagnosis of narcissism if you only had three or four more symptoms, you know? So subclinical behaviors, you're likely to notice that within your family. So, so you know, when, you, when you're kind of thinking about and processing your family and how it functions, keep these things in mind. Am I in a, am I in a, am I in a bind, excuse me, am I in a bind where I have, the experience of experiencing motivational conflict. Um, are my family members operating in such a way that there's subclinical behaviors here? They'll never be diagnosed if they ever went in to see a therapist, right? Um, you know, are there cyclic interactions in my family that highlights that something is terribly wrong, and even throughout generations? And I don't think I mentioned this yet, um, but, but you want to question yourself when you're interacting with your own family and ask yourself, do, do my interactions with my family leave me feeling silenced? You know, do my interactions within my family leave me feeling silenced? That there's no way to win, whether I go left, whether I go right, up or down. Anything I do is wrong. You know, are these interactions within my family making me feel like I have to be quiet? I have to stay in complete silence, right? And this is how you know that these are some of the things we're going to continue to talk about a little bit here tonight so you can get a full understanding. But these are some of the things I want you to kind of process, um, you know, within yourself and in your mind um, as you think about your dark empath family or dark evil relationships that may be occurring within your family. You know, somebody once said to me, or maybe I should pose it more as a question, someone once asked me, Tamara, do you think family is everything? And I said, mm, that's a tricky one, because family can be everything when it's healthy, when it's equal, when it's mutual, when it's reciprocal, when it's, you know, a situation where everybody understands each other's boundaries. But family isn't everything if they hurt you. And so I want you to kind of keep that in mind as you go through this live chat tonight. Family can be everything, but they're not everything when they hurt you. And that's where you have to learn to say, here's some boundaries. You're not going to hurt me. So um, in a little bit here, I'm going to give you guys... 15 uh, different tips and tools that you can use to kind of navigate this family. Okay, this I should say this family profile because that's basically what it is. Okay, let me let me let me go back because I see you guys chatting away here. Um. Okay, hold on, guys. I gotta figure out. I gotta figure out where we are. <laughs> I'm like, where are we? Hold on. Bear with me, guys. Mm, yeah, Phoenix. Phoenix says they show empathy when it's convenient. Yes. So, so a dark empath can have one of two forms of empathy, okay? One is effective empathy and the other is cognitive empathy. So I'm glad you brought this up, Phoenix. Cognitive empathy says this, that I can rationalize and reason what you want, as another person, but I can't feel that, right? You know, think of a situation where, I'm gonna use domestic violence as an example. You may feel extraordinarily um, compassionate towards and hurt for somebody that you see that has marks and bruises all over their body or has a black eye or has a swollen face because they've been beat in a domestic violence situation. You, as an empathic person, can kind of take your mind and put your mind in her situation or his situation, and you can actually feel maybe the pain that she's feeling, the rejection, the hurt, you know, the sorrow, the regret, all of it. That is 
affective empathy. You have the ability to feel. But cognitive empathy says this. I don't know in here what's going on with your situation or with you, but I know up here that this is what you want me to feel or this is what you want to hear. This is what you want me to feel for you. And so and so that is called theory of mind. And a lot of a lot of dark empaths lack theory of mind. They don't have the capacity to have effective empathy. And so cognitive empathy is what they, they kind of operate on. You know, think of people who get into the field of psychology. Think of people who get into policing, uh, who are judges and attorneys. You know, think about those individuals in those fields who are just cold, mean, careless, hateful. The list goes on. And, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen people like that in fields where empathy should be there, but it's not. And you've probably asked them or asked yourself about them, why are you even here? You know, there, there's people in my field and they're far from compassionate and it and it's really evident, too. And and I have asked myself within myself before, um, why are you in this field? Like, you know, why do you want to be a clinical psychologist? Why do you want to be a forensic psychologist who investigates mental illness and crime and murder? And the list goes on. You're far from compassionate. But most of the time, it's cognitive empathy that they are operating on. It's a tricky thing. You know, maybe at some point I will pick and pull apart in another live chat what cognitive and, and effective empathy actually looks like. That would be a very interesting chat. So um, let me know. Let me know if you want me to do that chat. I'll do that for you. Um, Ronald Zion, you are not late. And thank you for that. I'm glad to see you. You're certainly not late. I was late. I was late. Annie, Annie Welker, hello. Welcome to the chat. So glad to have you tonight. Says, my family is extremely fake and cold. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me, let me kind of jump on this a little bit, Annie. Uh, I, I can relate. I have extended family. I'm like, nope, stay back there. I don't want to know you. Uh, and then there's other ones where I'm like, come on into my life. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, Annie, w when it comes to family members who are extremely unauthentic, you really do have to ask yourself, are they unauthentic because of intergenerational trauma, which we're going to get into here in a little bit? Is it intergenerational trauma, meaning that somebody way back there in my ancestry modeled behaviors and thought patterns that then got passed on to my current generation and has negatively impacted my life and my mind and my family? When I see families who have um, traits of dark empathy, the, 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 my first question, if you're a client of mine or if I have a client sit in front of me, my first question is this, where did it start? And I once had a client say to me, I think it started with my mother. And then we realized over the course of our therapy together that it started way before her mom. So you may want to ask yourself, Annie Walker, is this intergenerational trauma that's creating these cyclic patterns of behavior, being quote unquote fake, being unauthentic, um, you know, being cold hearted and abusive and, you know, having cognitive empathy, uh, for example, did this really start with the family that I know now, or did it start way before I was born? So that might be a really healthy question for you, Annie, to kind of ask yourself. I've asked myself that. Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix says subclinical what? Okay, let me break down subclinical. Subclinical means the symptoms are not visible. They're not visible yet. They're, they're, they are symptoms that flies right under the radar of clinical concern. I hope that made sense. So, so let me give you a brief example. So, so you're my client. You know, you're seeing me for depression. You have every symptom of depression, uh, anxiety, can't sleep, overeating, gaining weight, insomnia, headaches, uh, anhedonia, or loss of, of pleasure in things you once enjoyed, uh, irritability and anger, suicidal thoughts. You have all of that, but it's not enough for me to diagnose depression because you're missing a couple more symptoms. So that's what subclinical means. I hope that makes sense, guys. Okay. <laughs> okay. B, you guys are wonderful, by the way. I just look at your comments and I'm, I just have to laugh sometimes. You guys are great. 
Um, okay, B says, this book is a survival guide to understanding, dealing with, and avoiding the economic, physical, and psychological abuses of guardianships, such as... Okay, where's the, where's the book, B? Did I miss the book? I probably did. Okay, maybe I'm misunderstanding. I don't know, B. If it's a book, list it, list it, okay? And I'll, 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 I'll call it out so other people can gain access to it. The Retro Woman 80 says, I'm pursuing a second bachelor's in human services. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, human services, concentration with children and family. Yeah. Uh, she says, Timmer, you are really helping me personally and with rounding that learning field out with the psychology. Oh God, I read that all wrong. Timmer, you're really helping me personally and with well rounding that learning field out with the psychology. Okay. I'm going to pull from that. So you're saying that you're 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 feeling motivated and inspired i think by my work i think that's what you're saying <laughs> i'm i'm gonna just pull that that's what it is okay i'm really happy for you um i, I think that's so great keep me updated okay I, I i think that's wonderful that's wonderful okay all right let me keep going guys and then we'll jump back into the content hovana hello welcome to the chat so glad to see you tonight i feel like i'm missing something Oh, yeah. So it's been cold lately, says, does Tamara or anyone here have books or how to get support system when estranged, estranged from all family? It's very hard to live like this, but I don't know how to find people who understand me. OK, that's a good one. So what I'm going to do, um, it's been cold lately, is as soon as this goes off, um, give me at least until tomorrow, guys. I'm going to post all the links in the description box. There's a wonderful book on family estrangement that I can also put in for you. It's been called lately and everybody else. Um, there's also some support groups online. So I'll try to post all that stuff. I hate ad says sometimes it feels like a prison, especially when trying to make sense of everything, but don't know how or who to tell about what you're experiencing. Absolutely. Um, it is hard, right? Because you can't necessarily go to the therapist, let's say, for example, up the street and, and say, my family's evil, you know, because what do you think they're, what do you think that they're going to think about you? They're going to say, okay, either you have schizophrenia or you're psychotic. Uh, you're, you, you have a personality disorder because maybe you exaggerate things or maybe you're misperceiving reality right so so you're right it is really difficult to find somebody who gets it um honestly my advice and suggestion to you uh uh i hate ads would be uh finding somebody who gets it right um trying to get as close as you can to somebody who gets it, reading books about it, watching videos like this, the list goes on. You really have to self-teach when it comes to this topic, don't you? Because it's not one that we find a lot about, you know? Jacob Taylor, hello, welcome to the chat. Glad to have you, says, uh, thank you for streaming. Yes, you're welcome, you're welcome. Yesterday I wanted to stream, but it was Black Friday. I'm like, I miss my people, I do. Napalm1334, hello, welcome to the chat, so glad to have you as well. Okay, Skylar Sparkles, hello, welcome, I don't remember seeing you before, says, you give vital information, I love it, thank you so much, um, I think that's wonderful, thank you for letting me know that, that's great. Okay, okay, all right, let's jump back in, okay guys, here's a few barriers to understanding dark family behaviors. You ready for this, guys? Probably gonna wanna take notes. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I document all of this in the description box so you can just click on things and there's the, the, the uh, description, okay? All right, so this, this I'm gonna call it a family dynamic. This, this dark empath family dynamic where under the surface, there's a lot of evil, there's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of lies, there's intergenerational trauma, there's dysfunctional behavior, there's an inability to communicate. You know, we could just throw all that under the carpet, right? So, so this dark empath, unstable family dynamic has barriers that are often built into the system over time. I'm going to explain that again. So 
within these dynamics, within, within unhealthy, toxic, dysfunctional family, there's often barriers that's built in the dynamic of the family. The first barrier, and this is what research supports and backs and suggests to people who are dealing with intergenerational trauma, is there's a lot of, how do I want to put this? There's a lot of impaired empathy. I'll put it that way. There's impaired empathy. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's no empathy, but it's impaired. And it's built into the dynamic of the family system. So let's say, for example, your great-grandmother was an abusive person. She built a trauma bond with your grandmother. It's her, your grandmother, and then it's you. So you're the you're the you're a part of the newer generation, okay? And, and you're trying to communicate with your family about how you feel, how they treat you, um, how you feel like you're the scapegoat, how they brush things under the carpet. They never openly talk about anything. They hide secrets. They pit people against each other, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit here. Let's say you mentioned that they're manipulative and they are, they are um, triangulating and you don't like how the family system communicates. Let's say, for example, your great-grandmother tells you that you're exaggerative you're the problem, and you need to learn some respect and get it together. Instead of your mom stepping in, for example, to protect you or to help you, and this has happened in my office, it happened two months ago, it happened last year with a family, it's very um, sad to watch, you know, but instead of your mom jumping in to protect you, she actually jumps in the situation against you, and so her impaired empathy is really the result of her mother being the dominant, controlling, narcissistic figure that she is. Does that make sense, guys? So instead of your mom jumping in to protect you against your grandmother or great-grandmother, um, she actually jumps in, but she's going against you, and she's on their side. So there's some impaired empathy because of generational trauma and generational toxicity. I hope that makes sense. I'm sure you guys can relate to that. Um, you also want to think of intergenerational trauma that goes all the way back to before your great-grandmother. You want to consider that because usually what happens in intergenerational trauma that's way up, way back there is that patterns of behavior gets kind of transferred um, or transmitted throughout generations. And your family foundation is built upon that unhealthy dynamic. So jealous parents... Competit competitiveness, uh, evil, dark, sneaky, manipulative behaviors, uh, triangulation, sexual assault, child molestation, uh, financial abuse, all of those ugly things are typically under the surface in families where there's intergenerational trauma. So you want to be able to go back as far as you can and figure out what, what was the dynamic there, you know? Um, another barrier to healthy communication within these dark empath families is religious trauma. Now that probably is, is, is not something that shocks you, but it shocked me when I did a little bit of research on this topic. I'm like, how in the world does religious trauma become a barrier? Um, but here's what happened. So you have a father who's a psychopath, but he also tends to be a bishop at a local church. What he does is he tries to force you to believe in religion because it kind of keeps you bound, doesn't it? Sometimes religiosity is more of a prison than it is freedom. And so your psychopathic father utilizes his role as a pastor or bishop to gain social prestige, to, to come across as loving, caring, uh, to, to really um, come across as if, you know, he's empathic, uh, you know, to gain social approval. But when he's behind closed doors, he's mean, he's disregarding. He's inconsiderate, he's abusive, the list goes on. So sometimes very strict religiosity is at the foundation of families where there's dark empathy built into the family system. Pastors or bishops who are um, not really pastors or bishops, they tend to be evil and sneaky and, and cunning, uh, these, these dark empath individuals uh, are not there to sow was to sow or add any positivity to anybody's life. They use cognitive empathy to get over on other people. They manipulate and they triangulate. And I'm sure you've seen that within your family if you can relate to this strict religiosity, okay? 
Um, let's see here. I'm going to say adoption. I'm going to add that in here as well. That sometimes what becomes a barrier to healthy communication within these dark empath families is sometimes adoption and fostering. Um, I, I'm going to give you an example of this. I once had a family who came in uh, for psychotherapy and I thought all of her children were her biological children and she she really surprised me. She's like, no, these are all my foster children and I have two adopted kids. And what she did though is she asked me not to tell my client, who was one of the kids, that he was adopted. And, you know, that was a really tough thing for me not to do, but I respected her as the parent, and I let it, I let it go, and I continued to see this kid for the next, I'm going to say, seven and a half years. He's no longer with me, but he, he, he really struggled emotionally and psychologically with the reality that his adopted mother used um, lies and deceit to keep him bound, she, you know, she, she really, what's the word, she really um, wanted him to believe that he was a part of the family system so that he would do anything that she would ask him to do, so that he would feel loved and cared for, and the list goes on, but once he finally found out at the age of 18 that that really wasn't his mother, it was very devastating, it was very traumatic for him, because he thought all of those years that he was a part of the, the bloodline, the family bloodline. So so what became a barrier in this dark empath uh, family? The mom is a dark empath. All she has is cognitive empathy. And the father, who's the adopted dad, I should have mentioned him as well, um, he tends to be very narcissistic. And so their behaviors together were toxic for this poor child. And he remained confused about his identity. He remained confused about who he was in his own world and where his family was, and the list goes on. It's... It's the mother who is clearly a dark empath. She utilized the knowledge that she had about him and she used it against him. And it kept him bound for many, many years. So sometimes, you know, adoption and, and foster, sometimes those families can be really detrimental. They're not the lovey-dovey. They're not always the lovey-dovey happy stories. Sometimes the adopted parents are pure evil. And I'm sure you guys, you guys have probably heard some stories of kids who have been adopted and fostered pure evil in some of these families. Okay, let me also mention too, before I go to the chat box and before we jump into the 15 tips on how to deal with the dark empath families, let me also throw in here, harsh authoritarian parenting can also be a part of dark empath families. So you have two parents, one who's a narcissist and one who's a psychopath, okay? Machiavellianism is not involved. So a psychopath and a narcissist. Your dad's a psychopath, your mom's a narcissist. Harsh authoritarian parenting, according to research, says, I am going to beat you into submission, cause you to lose your identity, cause you to believe that you are nobody, make you feel smaller, make you, make you kind of curl up and die kind of thing, right? Um, authoritarian parenting is really like a Hitler approach. That's the best way I can put that to you guys tonight. It's a Hitler approach to parenting and that harsh authoritarian parenting is often the result of dark empathy. Research suggests that, and this is research that has been done on dark empaths, they find that parents who are dark empaths have, have authoritarian parenting styles. It's not that disciplinarian approach where you know, you may have to use corporal punishment, which I don't like, but okay, some people think it's helpful. Um, you may have to yell at your kids sometimes, or you may have to correct them in a way that maybe the world doesn't think is the right way. But at the end of that correction, you love them and you tell them, I don't want you to do that again, okay? Because I love you, right? That is authoritative, meaning you, you're still up here with your kid, right? You still have a certain level of respect. You have a certain level of experience over that child, but that child knows at the end of the day that you love them. Authoritarian parenting says, I'm Hitler, and you better cry and run, you know? It's utilizing fear and insecurity and harsh tactics against you as an individual. So let's say you have a dark empath mom, dad. Don't be surprised if they parented you in a way that was cold, that was hateful, you didn't feel loved, you didn't feel corrected, you just felt abused. And there is research that backs the idea that authoritarian parenting is often associated with dark empath parents. Um, let me also add in here before I go to the chat box, um, emotional reactivity 
and relational aggression is something that you're going to find at the core of dark empath families. They don't know if it's a, it's, I'll put it this way, if it's a mother and a father who's dark, who's a dark empath, they have a really hard time relating in a healthy fashion. They are authoritarian, they are bullies, they are cold, they are manipulative, they're triangulating. And so their whole repertoire, for lack of a better word, of, of communication skills is detrimental, harmful, and unhealthy. So they have a very poor relational style, but then they are also very emotionally reactive. Think of the histrionic personality, the individual who's very theatrical, and they're loud, and they get angry, and they just snap on the drop of a hat. Um, and they don't know how to communicate without blowing things up and, and really being dominating and overbearing and overwhelming to other people. So keep in mind that, that, that parents that are, are dark empaths, they tend to be emotionally reactive and they also tend to show relational aggression. Okay, let me pause, and then I'm going to give you guys the 15 tips on how to deal with these family members. Okay, let me go back to the chat box. I don't want to get too far behind. <laughs> Thank you, Napalm 1334. That so sweet of you says, wow, she explained a very complex topic so eloquently. Very well said. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you. Sometimes I'm like, am I rambling? You know, like it's in my mind. I don't know if I'm getting it across to you guys. So bear with me if I'm rambling at times. N W, hello, welcome to the chat. Glad to see you tonight. Um, Kim B, hello, welcome. Anyways, hello, welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight as well. Oh my goodness, did I skip something? Keisha Evans, hello. Welcome to the chat. So glad to see you. It looks like you love the chat. So very, very glad to see that. Ooh, Havana has a great question. She says, what about toxic passive aggressive cousins that ghost and hang up the phone on their family members for no reason? Yeah, toxic passive aggressive cousins. Well, you know that's in there too, right? Toxic passive aggressive cousins. Hmm, I don't know where I would put them. I really don't, but I give you all permission not to talk to them again if you have to. Like, you know, you don't have to deal with that. You know what I mean? Um, you know, family, they can get angry with each other. You, you, you know, you can, you can uh, what's the word? You can kind of not mesh very well, right? Communicating with certain family members feels like nails down a chalkboard or sandpaper. Okay, we can deal with that. Um, but, but here's the issue, too. If you're dealing with passive-aggressive family members, you know, you really have to ask yourself, if they're passive aggressive in one way, what other ways can they be passive aggressive? And you might want to consider other passive aggressive behaviors being triangulation. I'm going to go to that family member and pull them in. I'm going to go that to family me that family member over there and pull them in too. I'm going to go back there and pull in Uncle Charlie. And I'm going to get everybody kind of clashing, right? And being on my side. So there's some family members, you know, if you see passive aggressive behavior, I'd start taking some steps backwards and reassess. Is this an okay situation or is it not? You know, to me, passive aggressive behavior can be very evil. You know, you want to see it on a spectrum. Clinically, I try to see it on a spectrum. You know, at the far end, which is, I'm going to say a zero, uh, maybe there's absolutely no passive aggressive behavior there. And that person is very open and healthy fantastic maybe a five is okay you're a little bit passive aggressive slamming doors and not talking to me and huffing and puffing all around me and slamming things down okay but then on the other side of that spectrum which maybe let's say is a 20 um on that spectrum zero to 20 so 20 now now we're talking about vindictive now we're talking about rage we're talking about stalking behavior we're talking about uh using social media against you we're talking about um, you know, passive aggressive behavior where the individual talks about you behind your back and gets trouble stirred, you know, like they're stirring a pot of soup. So, um, yeah, you know, I think there should be a limit with passive aggressive behavior when it comes to family members. It really should be. Vanna E. Hello. Welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. Says my sister swore at me as as a child, mom rocked me as if to soothe, but repeated, ours too bad, 
No one loves you. No one will ever love you. Not a family to me. Okay, that's a little confusing to me, but I'm going to pull from that. Um, it sounds like there's some toxic family interactions there. Hopefully, Vanna E., you're in a, in, a, in a place in your life right now where you can say, you know what? I don't want you a part of my life. You know, I once told uh, one of my clients in the past that I love, I love the idea of family. I and, and hear me really good, right? It's an idea of family. I love the idea of family. It's very attractive. It's like somebody being in love with the idea of being in love. Doesn't necessarily mean you're in love, but you're in love with the idea of being in love. Well, it's kind of the same way with family, you know? I love the concept of family. That's a concept, right? The reality is that we don't always have those families that you see on Full House, for example, for those of you who are around my age. You know, we don't always see those families who are tight and close-knit, right? That's the reality of this, not the idea of it. The idea of family is beautiful, but when you look at the reality of some family systems, you're like, mm-mm, I'd, I'd be better off not even talking to you, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Sounds toxic and complex. Okay. Napalm 1334 says, My cousin married a minister who alienated her into this strict um, evangelical cult, and now he is leaving to work in business. Can't make this up. Yeah, no, you probably... No, nah, I, I believe you. I believe you, Napalm 1334. I, I'm going to tell you, one of my... Um, on my father's side of the family, one of my distant cousins my, my grandmother told me about this uh she said uh, uh some guy from overseas he was a bishop uh was i mean literally a couple hours away from walking down the aisle with one of my cousins and literally left the entire country he left here okay she was literally going to go pick up her dress so they could get married and he completely disappeared and she this is the this is like my worst fear standing literally at the altar doing rehearsals before she jumped into the actual ceremony and he completely left the country adios amigos and he was a bishop so i don't know take from that what you will i i, I personally believe and i've seen this even in my work that in the realm of religiosity that's where evil can hide the most because because we're constantly under this false assumption that if you're in religion, you must be good. If you're a bishop, you must be for people's well-being. You know, if 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 you know if you believe in God and angels, you must be a wonderful person, and that is just simply not the case. It's not the case. I'm sure you guys can agree and and relate to that one too. All right, let me keep going, guys. I don't want to lose you. Um, by hitting the wrong button, so bear with me. Cynthia Hughes, hello, welcome to the chat, so glad to have you tonight, says, they break us, leave us to fix us, uh, I'm sorry, they break us, leave us to fix our broken selves, yeah, absolutely, keep this in mind, Cynthia, and the rest of you on this live chat tonight, they break you, families that are unhealthy, dark empath families, families where there's really deep-seated narcissism throughout generations, that can happen as well. The, these kind of families, I don't always, I don't think that they always know that they are breaking you. Does that make sense? Somebody in that family line may have some ability to feel some guilt, um, and they may recognize that they're cyclic behaviors are problematic but i but i honestly don't believe that they are fully aware of how they harm us or how they harm family members and part of the reason is intergenerational trauma it started way back there and it's become kind of like this embedded tapestry or this 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 interwoven am i saying that right interwoven i feel like i'm saying that wrong uh kind of confusion and it's lasted throughout generations so it's embedded and it's embedded in how everybody in your family communicates so i don't know if family members always know that they are leaving you to fix your broken heart and your broken mind i hate to say that but i'm not sure they're aware um i have a client uh, i just told three or four weeks ago um yeah a couple weeks ago i told her you you really need to examine is is your mom the result of generations of trauma and problematic and dysfunctional beliefs. And she's 
as much of a victim as you are, or or on the flip side of that, is she just evil? Because because throughout generations, this is how your family line has behaved. So just something to think about, guys. SH, hello, welcome to the chat. So glad to have you as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Any, I'm going to say this and then we're going to go back to the content. Anyway, says, um, dissociating impacts my memory badly. Oh, I missed that beginning part of it, didn't I? Um, let me also, let me touch on dissociating just for a second. So anyways, is talking about dissociating. Okay. So let's, let's say you are in this, uh, toxic family dynamic and you don't know how to get out. You're trapped. You feel trapped. Maybe you're financially obligated. Maybe you're psychologically and emotionally obligated or stuck. Maybe you have a trauma bond with somebody, so you just can't get out, right? What is the next point of escape for you? Dissociating. The only way to survive when you feel trapped is to dissociate. If you can't literally get out or you can't seem to make things work, the best way to get out is right up here, you know? And the sad part about that is there are a lot of individuals who are dealing with dark empath family traits, narcissists, psychopaths, manipulators, triangulators, and there's no real way out. They dissociate. And dissociating is kind of pulling away from reality. You may you may do that intentionally, but mainly it's it's I'm sorry, let me turn it around. You may do it intentionally, but for the majority of cases, it's unintentional. You're just pulling away from reality because you can't manage it. And so anyways, you're right that sometimes dissociating occurs. It occurs on a daily basis, and it can also reach a clinical level where you can then be diagnosed with having dissociation. Okay. All right, guys, let me give you these 15 tips and then we're going to wrap up because I'm a little bit over time here. So how do you deal with these kind of how do you deal with these kind of families? Right. It's, it's kind of scary. Um, it's complex. Um, and, and I also think it takes a lot of courage to be able to say, you know what, this is my family. This is how they have functioned for many years. I've got to find a way of escape. So the first way that I suggest and I want to make sure that I'm giving you the most important one first. OK. The first thing that I suggest is avoid what's called subgroupings, okay? In, in the field of psychology, we have what's called family systems therapy. And it's where we look at how a family functions as a system. We look at the, the fact that a family can sometimes be like a bus. You have all the family members on one bus and we're all going one particular way. So it's a family system. Some people who are dysfunctional and toxic within families, especially the dark empaths, the psychopaths, the narcissists, those who enjoy or get pleasure from hurting other people, so that's Machiavellianism, they function within the system where they create subgroupings, subgroupings. The cousins are over here, and those are all the manipulators. The triangulators are over here, and those are all the family members that, you know, they lie. They're pathological liars. They're harmful. The other group of family members are over there. Those are the aunts that are a clique. The uncles are over there, and those are the uncles who talk about everybody in the family. So, so the best way to deal with that kind of thing is to step out of those subgroupings. Refuse to be a part of the cliques within the family. You can't survive if you're being sucked into the family system that's dysfunctional and toxic, right? So you want to step out of those subgroupings. You also want to reject this, this internal family uh, dynamic where everything is a secret. Most family trauma and intergenerational trauma is the result of family secrets. You want to step out of that or reject that. Say, no, I am not going to be a part of that family secret. I'm either going to step out of this and be honest and open about it, or I'm just not going to talk about it at all. I'm not going to talk to you about it. But I refuse to become the next family member who gets sucked into the family dynamic of holding secrets, lying about things, pushing reality down, and acting like it doesn't exist. Okay, 
You also want to learn healthy ways to identify and express your emotions. You guys are doing that tonight by being on this live chat with me. You're learning different ways of seeing your family. You're learning different ways of managing your own thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors. That's the best way to combat a whole lineage of dysfunctional behavior. Learn what you're feeling, label it, use it to your benefit and move on, you know, and keep moving into your future. So you have to be able to recognize and understand what's going on in your mind and in your heart, right? You also want to avoid, and this is backed by research as well, avoid trying to hash things out with certain personalities. Some personalities you just shouldn't hash things out with. Um, I, I once had a client, I'm going to say about four years ago, she was a wonderful person, but she married the wrong man, okay? And, and so she brought him to therapy because she wanted to hash things out with him in an hour session. That turned into the most ugly situation I'd ever seen in therapy. It ended with her crying and threatening to get a divorce and him threatening to hurt her when they get home. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible session. Thankfully, it wasn't my session. Um, but I was a part of that. I was observing this family to see if I can kind of support them and help this family. And, and, and one of the things that I thought was a little odd is is how the wife wanted to bring him into therapy and then hash things out right there in a therapy session. What she didn't realize, though, is you can't hash things out with a narcissist. You also can't hash things out with a person who doesn't have personal insight, which most narcissists don't have. Most psychopaths, you know, they have some insight, but they're pretty dysfunctional. You can't hash things out with a family member who's, who gets pleasure out of hurting you, right? Because, because what's happening in that hashing out moment is they're actually getting pleasure from seeing that you're so upset. So you can't hash things out with everybody in your family. You also want to question, does this family member have cognitive or effective empathy? Cognitive or effective empathy. Once you can determine what the empathy is there, then you can make your moves from there. What's the point in talking to a family member or trying to make the relationship work if there is absolutely no effective empathy and everything that they do is based on how they process and think about things in the world cognitive empathy is going to end at some point it, it doesn't you know it doesn't uh what's the word i'm looking for it doesn't um it doesn't support you at all it doesn't you know cognitive empathy is what it is it's knowing logically what other people want but that's about it there's nothing here so try to determine within your family is this somebody who has cognitive empathy or is this somebody that has effective empathy what's going on here you know you also want to try to identify family roles figure out what your role is um let me throw some roles at you briefly so one is the hero you know, that's the rescuer, the one who's always there to support the family and back the family and maybe financially support the family. That's usually the good family member. The scapegoat, a lot of you probably feel you play the role of a scapegoat. There is the addict in the family who's the one who kind of attaches to things and can't let it go, right? They are addicted. They have an addictive personality. There's the lost child. I'm going to post these things in the description box for you, okay? So don't worry. Um, but there's the lost child, that child that goes way over there. My brother's kind of like that to a certain extent. And he goes over there and he sits in the corner. And it's like, I'm the baby of the family. I don't really know which way to go here. So I'm just going to see if I can figure this out in my own time, you know? Those are usually the kids that go to their room and they stay in their room until they're 50 years old. You know what I mean? So there's the lost child. Figure out your role and the role that others are playing in your family. The best way to get ahead of a manipulator, the best way to get ahead of somebody who triangulates is to figure out what role they play. And sometimes those roles can change too, right? Maybe your narcissistic brother was once the scapegoat and now he's the hero. So I'm going to post all this, okay, guys? So if, if I'm going too fast or if you're missing something, don't worry. I'm going to make sure that I... I include this information. Okay, the next one I suggest is invent new ways of existing within your family. The, the way that my cousins and I have kind of broken the family curse, so to speak, is by doing what our parents didn't do. We have fantastic parents. Like my cousins, my first cousins, they have great parents. Like there's nothing they wouldn't do for their kids. And my mom's the same way. There's nothing she wouldn't do for us. And and we learned over time, and I learned over time, that this is kind of like a family race here in the sense that my parents and, and their parents, my cousin's parents, 
they had to run this race, you know, and they got tired. And they said, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here at a blue collar job or I'm going to stop here by dropping out of school or I'm going to stop here by just getting a certification. And what they did is they pushed us ahead, though. And so that led me to become successful in my career. That led to my cousin becoming a judge in Atlanta, Georgia. That led to my brother becoming a wonderful caretaker for his family. So, so you know, learn and try to invent new ways of existing within your family. If you see that there's an underlying toxicity, try to find some way out of that. And, and that's what I did, my cousins did. It, it, it is, I think, more easier said than done. So keep that in mind too, guys. It usually is... Uh, more easier said than done. But if you see some way to get out, get out. You know what I mean? Um, I also say su to, um, I also suggest figuring out what your boundaries are. Are my boundaries within my family system, are they rigid? Are they porous, right? Meaning that they're easily flexible, like people get over on me. Um, or rigid, meaning that it's really firm, nobody can get through. Or, it, or are my boundaries healthy? Because within a toxic family where there's dark empath traits, you've got a narcissist, you've got a psychopath, and you've got somebody who likes to see people hurt. What boundary do you need with that family member? And so you want to be able to identify, what's my boundary here? Do I have financial boundaries? Do I have relational boundaries? Do I have healthy boundaries that says to that family member over there, you can only go but so far. So examine your boundaries. That's important. You also want to examine the patterns of intergenerational trauma within your family. You know, is this part of my family, does this part of my family have a lineage of, of children who have been sexually violated? Does that part of my family over there have a lineage of people who's been incarcerated? Does that part of my family over there tend to embrace and support and pump up the narcissism that's in my family? So figure out those patterns of intergenerational trauma. Some people call it a family curse, you know? It's like patterns of behavior that are just not easy to erase, you know? It's cyclic. It's cyclic, for lack of a better and, and clinical term. I also say, too, learn as much as you can. You guys are doing it on this chat. There's literally 150 of you who are sitting in this live chat right now. There's a little over 150, I think, that's sitting in this live chat. So you're doing the best thing for yourself. That's the first step towards getting out of a situation where there's dark empathy. You're trying to figure this out and learn about it and examine your own situation, continue to do that. I also say develop a spiritual understanding of relational evil. You know, I, I'm going to say my field is so, so behind when it comes to the topic of evil relationships because there's no scientific data and there's no numbers. There's no statistics where psychology can say, yep, evil exists. The, the topic of evil, as I talked about in my last live chat, tends to be religious, spiritual, and philosophical, and sometimes existential as well. You know, it's, it's, it's more about processing life. Psychology totally rejects the concept of evil because there's no numbers to it. But I encourage you, because of that, I encourage you to embrace some understanding of evil. Without that knowledge, you can't see who's evil in your world. If you just push down and say, push down the reality of and just say to yourself, there's no such thing as evil, then you're really opening the door to evil in your world, right? Because you're not going to have your eyes or your glasses on right, right? Because you're so busy trying to deny it. So um, embrace the concept of evil. Um, and break family curses. Find some way to break them. Some way. One little step could be a way to break family curses for sure. Let me make sure I'm giving you everything. I feel like there was something else I'm missing. Was that 15, guys? I really need to start writing this down. Did I give you 15 things? I think I did. Mm, I think I did. If I didn't give you, if I didn't give you 15, call me out on it. <laughs> Let me go to the chat box, okay, guys? And then I'm gonna give you the rest. If there's more, I need like a minute to process and make sure I gave you all 15. 
All right, let me let me look at the chat box. It's been cold lately says, I remember before my dad passed, he told me he was so mean because his dad was that way. Yeah, that's a great example. And his grandparents, it's all he ever knew. Um, it just gets passed down. He never had therapy or mental help. Yes, it's been cold lately. That is a star comment tonight because I can pick and pull that apart briefly. Let me comment on this because this may be helpful for a lot of you that uh, family, family curses or intergenerational trauma can begin with you know, one family member being treated a certain way and because they have learned over time how to adapt to that, they then begin to exhibit that in their own family. You know, we are kind of like, we are kind of like sheep within our families, right guys? Meaning that we kind of buzz around and follow family members. Sometimes we don't know how to, or we can't see a way to get out of that family system. And so what do we do like sheep, right? We all herd together in families. And so, you know, if, if your dad, it's been called lately, said, you know, this is the way that I was treated and, you know, I've just been this way forever. He's got what my, he's, he has what my mom and I call the boss syndrome, right? Which is kind of like this sheep kind of mentality of I'm just going to do what everybody else does in that system because that's the only way I know how to exist. The best way out of that is what I suggested uh, as one of the 15 tips to deal with this is to find some way out of that dynamic and you're taking the first step in watching this YouTube video, reading and learning and growing and shifting your perspective. You're starting that process of, of coming out of that, that sheep syndrome. I'm going to call it a syndrome. Let me also say, too, that our brain is interesting, and it's been cold lately. I'm going back to your comment. Our, our brain is really interesting because once cortisol gets kicked off in the body, uh, and cortisol is a stress hormone, for those of you who aren't uh, aware of that, um, you know, it's, it's a stress hormone that gets kicked off by what's going on in the environment. And so sometimes people like your, your father, it's been called lately, they learn over time that if, if I'm going to survive, then I have to be okay with acting a certain way and engaging in a certain way within this family system. And then somehow over time, the brain kind of adapts to that way of behaving and that becomes the new character. That's pretty scary, right? But it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like children who, you know, adopt or I'll put it this way, it's true, it's, it's like children who adapt to a very violent environment. Kids who are in urban cities or any inner cities, in order for them to survive, they kind of band together. They learn how to exist amongst each other. That happens within a family system as well. It's just who we are as humans. We kind of rely on somebody else to show us what we need to be. Or in order to protect ourselves and bring up the boundary or the defense, or the wall to protect ourselves, we sometimes become the person who mistreated us. Not always, but sometimes. Thank you for that, it's been cold lately. That's fantastic. Okay. Woo, fairy girl, I'm so sorry. Fairy girl says, she's talking about my whole family. Oh Lord. Well, fa fairy girl, don't feel bad, okay? I think we all have families where we're like, mm, no, I don't like this. So don't don't feel bad. I think, you know, even through this live chat, there's, there's parts of my own psyche. I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds like so-and-so. You know what I mean? So that's just kind of how it goes. Don't feel bad. Okay. I feel like I'm missing some, oh my God, I'm so behind. Lisa G says, you are a lot stronger than you think. You have the power within yourself to choose. Be kind and gentle with yourself. You know what you need and want. Look within. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, look within. Go within. I, I think the first step towards becoming more authentic, stronger relationally, and protective in a healthy way over yourself is to look within. I agree. Frankie Robinson, hello, welcome to the chat, glad to have you tonight. Uh, Frankie Robinson says avoid subgrouping, yes. Okay, so here's what subgrouping is, uh, if you missed it. A subgrouping is basically this, that I'm within a family unit. Here, I'm going to draw it out. Let me, let me show you how this looks. Hold on, guys, bear with me. We're going to wrap up in like two minutes. It would help if I had the right stuff. 
Okay, so this is this is this is what I mean by subgrouping. Uh, so these are the parents. Hold on, bear with me, and don't make fun of my drawing, guys. The kids. Okay. Here's subgrouping. We we have the parents. Okay, the parents have a secret, and the secret is not supposed to be shared with the kids. But here's where a subgroup happens. Hold on. So here's what happens. You have parents, the kids. The parents know that you guys are adopted, but you don't know you're adopted. But the grandparents do. And so the grandparents and the children start talking, okay? And the parents stay out of the loop. That's what I mean by subgrouping. So let's do it this way too. A clique could be five of your cousins within your family. Oh, I thought maybe we froze. I was going to panic. Okay, sorry guys. It could be cousins that's within your whole family system and they are a click, so they're a subgroup. So avoid subgrouping. When you subgroup, you're now becoming a part of the problem rather than the remedy, because subgrouping means manipulation, triangulation, right? Spreading of secrets and rumors. Somebody in that subgroup knows something that everybody else doesn't know, and so that creates a subgroup. Grandparents are sometimes really good at subgroups, really good at subgrouping. You wanna avoid that. Yeah, I hate ads says, asks me, is dissociating like daydreaming or zoning out? Absolutely. So dissociating is a really strong, intense form of daydreaming. It's so intense and it's so ingrained in, in how you process life that it's really hard for somebody to like slap you out of it. At least when you're daydreaming, somebody can tap you or snap and you come out of it. Dissociating can sometimes be like a process. It's you leaving that moment and it may take you a little longer to bounce back. You can actually, uh, in clinical studies on dissociating, you can actually see where the person actually goes blank. You know, it's like their brain is offline because dissociating really is pulling away from reality or somewhere else. Um, and it's protective. It's protective. Great question. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I didn't miss, miss any of you. Eileen Farley, hello, welcome to the chat. So glad to have you tonight, says, I finally caught a live. It's been a while. Yes, it has. Hello, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I see you saying hello. All right, let me keep going, guys. Then we're going to wrap up. Positive vibes only. Hello, welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. Says, as they get older, it gets worse. Sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes if you're in a family where there's dark empathy, sometimes aging makes it worse because you got to consider Alzheimer's disease as a possibility, senility, right, or dementia. So those things kind of exacerbates the issue. Most clinical research, however, suggests that individuals with a personality disorder, narcissism, borderline personality, um, you know, antisocial personality disorder, those things kind of become less as the individual grows older. So keep that in mind that some narcissists, antisocial personality disorder, um, borderline personality, all the personality disorders, um, most of those individuals get better with age, but sometimes they can swing the other way and get worse. So it just depends. Okay, let me make sure I'm not losing you. Colibri Flyer, hello, welcome to the chat. Hopefully I said that correctly. Glad to see you tonight. Mm hmm yep, I agree. Narcs are, ta Narcs are takers, very much agree with that. Yeah, Frankie Robinson highlights what I said earlier, which is inventing new ways to engage. I think I said that. If not, call me out on it. I think I said that. But inventing new ways to engage. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yep. Here's what happens. When you find new ways to engage within a dysfunctional family system, you're actually going against the grains of what has been normal. 
And that throws the whole family system off. You know what I mean? So be ready for that. If you decide to go against the grains of what your family does, right, their patterns of behavior, know that it's really going to cause some confusion, but it may be well needed, you know? All right, guys, we're at 723. Emmy, hello, welcome to the chat. Glad to have you tonight. Says, thank, thank you. Nice find today. Much appreciated. Yes, you're welcome. Glad to hear that. Danny, hello, welcome to the chat. So glad to have you as well. Says, I just don't subject my daughter to their maladaptive behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to avoid. You could just say goodbye, adios amigos. Not that I'm encouraging that. I do not like family estrangement. But if that's the only way to survive, you know what I mean, Danny? By all means, that may be what's needed. Phoenix, thank you so much. That's so sweet of you. Says, you make me feel hopeful. Oh, that's so sweet. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you for that. That's so sweet. Yeah. Emmy says, wow, evil, evil info is new for me. Yeah, absolutely. I want to post my last live chat for you in case you missed it. Okay. I have Annie Telgrand, hello, welcome to the chat, says subgroups are toxic and I found myself in the middle of a lot of drama. I'm the black sheep somehow. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let me just say, and I talk about my mom a lot on this channel, I think my mom has always been the black sheep of this family. I now have a cousin who's the black sheep of the family um, and, and I have a few others who are black sheep. That's that's where subgrouping kind of originates, right? You, you, you kind of make somebody the black sheep because they haven't met your expectations and then you cling to all those other people who have. And so that's creating a subgroup. You're pushing that other family member out while you're hugging and embracing all the other ones and it's so ugly right guys it's ugly sean hammer hello welcome to the chat so glad to have you tonight and william says happy belated thanksgiving thank you so much and happy belated thanksgiving to you too lisa or life as page i'm sorry about that life as page says good evening glad to be here welcome so glad to have you tonight as well i'm signing off guys <laughs> thank you Havana says I wish you were my therapist Tamara oh that's so sweet thank you for that thank you so much that's so beautiful um okay yes Frankie Robinson it is she says right it's so ugly yeah it is I hate it um okay guys okay I'm gonna sign off love you so much I said it all the time thank you for making this a wonderful live chat I'm not gonna do a video on Sunday I'm gonna let this live chat do its thing and um, any comments, questions, whatever, post in the description box for me. and uh, Not the description, the comment section. See, this is why I got to go, because I'm getting tired. In the comment section, okay? Feel free to post some questions for me. I'm going to answer them. Um, let me... Okay, I see some new ones coming in. Hold on, guys. I'm going to read these really quickly. Danny says, Dearest Tamara, next time just call my mom's family by name when describing subgrouping. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hear the toxicity, even in how you describe them. Sean Hammer says, you help me so much, Tamara. I have risen above the circling, the circling narcs in my family and my business. Wow, that's amazing. Good for you. And thank you for that very sweet comment. You know, you kind of want to think of family members who are dark empaths. Kind of, kind of envision yourself being one person. And you've got all these lions encircling you, you know. That's, that's a family with dark empathy for sure. All right, guys. I will see you in the next live chat. We got some pretty cool stuff coming up, so stick around. I'll see you in the next live chat. Have a good night, guys, and a, and a happy weekend because it's almost over, but have a good weekend. I'll see you soon.